The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Getting a little feedback. Getting some feedback. This is uh, Dr. D. Richard Hip. Uh, he's a Richard. Richard Richard. <laughs> and uh, he's an Atlanta, Georgia native. Now lives in Charlotte. Uh, some of you might know him. He uh, is the author and uh, original programmer of SQLite. Uh, Life. And he also uh, created Fossil, a source code uh, management system. And he, the back end database that he uses for Fossil is Maria, no, <laughs> SQLite, <laughs> of course. And uh, he's going to talk to us about full text search and the algorithms of how to do it. Okay. And welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Small correction. I was actually born about a mile from here at Presbyterian Hospital. I'm a Charlotte native. Not many of us around, but all my people are from around here. There's a bunch of hips in this area. Um, there's, a, there's a physician here in town. Uh, uh, he's a neurosurgeon uh, named uh, Stephen Hip. And uh, I would used to get calls for him all the time, you know, and I'd answer the phone and people would start telling me about their medical problems. And I said, are you looking for the neurologist or the mathematician? Oh, I want the neurologist. Okay, well, I have his number right here. Let me give you that number. But listen, if you ever have any trouble with your differential equations, you give me a call. <laughs> and um, I never have met Stephen. I, I keep telling him every time they, they call, you know, tell, tell Stephen when you see him that we've got to get together for lunch. But I think he's one of the South Carolina hips. There's uh, two kind of groups of hips in this area. There's the ones here in, North, here in Charlotte area, and there's some in South Carolina. And... Um, uh, the ones in South Carolina have money. I'm not related to them. So, <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit today about just full text search. Um, I, and, and this is not talking about a particular implementation or anything. This is just going to be the theory behind it, how it works, what's going on behind the scenes. This is so that you'll know kind of what's happening when you do the full text search. Not intended to give you all the information you need to implement yourself, though it would be a good foundation for that. Uh, nor am I gear pushing you in any particular implementation of it. This is just to tell you what's happening and why it, why it seems like it's a hard problem. Well, what is full text search? Um, in a nutshell, full text search is what Bing and Google and Yahoo do for you. You type in some keyword into the search engine like Linux and it goes out and finds amongst some collection of documents such as all the web pages on the World Wide Web all the documents that have that keyword in it and you're all familiar with how this works you, people who really don't understand what's going on they use it all the time it's very intuitive it's a natural thing you can type in a single word or you can type in two words or three words and it finds all the documents that have all those words in them now what and uh, what, so what some people don't realize is that, that it can do quite a bit more than this. You know, some people, uh, my, my wife is a, is, a, is a musician. Now, now amongst this crowd, she's you know, not really technical, but amongst musicians, she's like a tech guru, you know. And so when anybody, whenever her musician friends, when their computers break, they always come to her. And, um, but she uses like Google, she uses it in, in uh, if she wants to go to Facebook, she types Facebook into Google. I mean, she never uses the URL bar to go to Facebook or her bookmark. She types it into the search bar at Facebook and then clicks on the link. And there's actually a lot of people that do that. Everybody uses search now. Um, and you know, you might want to implement search on your own websites. Uh, why not just use Google, well, or, and, or Yahoo, or Bing? Well, it, maybe you don't want to see all the advertising. Uh, maybe you don't want yeah, your competitors' links to appear at the top of the list. And, 
or maybe you're, maybe you're indexing a private website that's not on the public internet, or maybe it's just a part of an application that's not really network connected. It's a help system in a system. So there's a lot of reasons to want to do full text search, um, even though the, the, three, the big three do a great job of it. So you can type in a bunch of words and find the words. What some people don't realize is that if you put double quotes around a search term like that, this is a phrase search, and that will find all instances of those three words in order. So in, in the previous search I did here, it was just looking for the words snippet function cannot, and it found web pages that had those three words in it. But if I put double quotes around that, it insisted that the three words be in that specific order. And I worked very hard to find three words that would end up on the SQLite website. But <laughs> took me a while, I found them. Um, so some other things you can do, um, Say you do a search, you're looking for you know, SQL full text, and when you do something like that, you get just tons and tons of links to SQL Server. And suppose, well, I am not doing SQL Server, so I don't, want to, I don't want to do that. You can add a term minus Microsoft, say, and it will exclude those pages that have Microsoft in it, sort of an anti-search term. And all, the, all of the big three search engines do this sort of thing. Um, another thing you can do, I don't know if you're aware of this, you can do an OR search. You can, uh, so this, this particular one is going to look for documents that have SQL, full text search, and then have either SQLite or Postgres in their name as well. But one or the other. It doesn't have to have to be both. It's got to have all of the first four, but then one of those last two. And all the search engines do this. Now, there's some other things that, that full text search in the general sense will do that Bing and Yahoo and Google don't do. Like you can do near searches. And so I've, I've put in, and, and the, the search engine on the SQLite website does this, and so that's why I'm using this as an example. Um, snippet near developer. That means the, it's looking for documents that have the word snippet and developer in it, but they're kind of close to each other. I think in the default setting for SQLite, it's they have to be within 10 words of each other. But, uh, yeah, question. none of the big three do that? Yeah, at least none that I've been able to figure out. Do you know a way to get, to, uh, get them to do this? I feel like I'd seen that years ago, but now I can't find it. I mean, I went digging around. I talked to people. I couldn't find any way to do it. I mean, it, it's not that hard to do from a technical point of view, and I'm going to show you the algorithms in just a minute. Uh, they, use, they, they use the nearness to, to help rank it. Yeah. I did not know that. Because, you, know, you know, the ranking functions is, are like, you know, super secret things, and I don't, I haven't signed that NDA. And if I had, if I, had I wouldn't be giving this talk, would I? Um, but, uh, yeah, so this is an easy thing to compute. I'll show you the algorithms in just a minute. Um, and, and, and you can do things like say, well, you know, it has to come after or before. Question? It's kind of combined because the, because the comment was the full text search is only used for finding the pages and ranking is showing which order in which they're displayed. But you know, uh, for, for, for a small website, that's entirely true and it's an entirely legitimate thing to do and that's entirely what I do here because there aren't that many different pages that you can possibly get. If you put in a search term that hit every single page on my website, that's only about 1,000 pages. And so you know, we can sort through that. But if you put in a really broad search term into one of the internet search engines and it hit a million pages, you can't really evaluate and rank those and pick the top 10 and still get the results back to the user in 100 milliseconds or less. So you've got to kind of combine both the ranking and the search in one big step. So, uh, so you can do near searches and that, that can be useful sometimes. And I think the reason they omit this from the internet search engines is because most users they just going to type in words. They, you know, most users don't even know about phrase search, much less or or search. And this is getting really complicated. And it's just more confusion than was really seen as necessary. This does not sell more advertising, and so we'll just leave that out. That's not helpful. But it can be useful for specialized functions, and a lot of this, a lot of search engines do it. And then another thing that 
it comes up, this is, uh, comes up useful is a prefix search. And, and this is not really useful for you directly as a user of a search engine. It actually works on the one I've got on SQLite website. Um, where here I'm looking for all documents that contain words that begin with PS or XE. And so it found, you know, pseudo here and that's an acronym for power safe overwrite and then the name of some method on an object. So um, where this sort of thing would come in handy is if you were building an application around full text search. You were, you were doing something where the user, and you're doing search as you type, and the user starts typing things in, and you want to stay, show the, the search results as they're typing. Well, you would modify what they've typed to put an asterisk after the last word. So it's going to show everything that begins with the word they're currently typing. You see how that works? So you can do those sorts of searches as well. So that's all well and good. Well, what's it really involved here? There's really a lot going on behind the scenes, and, I, and that's the whole point of this talk. I went to, oh, I mentioned I'm going to finish up. I've got a demo I'm going to give you. I'll show you. I've got some code that you can download that you can do. Really easy to use. You can use it as a basis for uh, a search on a website. But, in, but right now, the, the things you've got to think about is first you have to identify the documents. What, what constitutes a document that you're going to be searching? What, what's going to be your search result? What's the granularity of this? Do you look, you know, do you look on individual paragraphs within the document, entire documents? If your search result came back and says, oh yeah, those two words you typed, they're used in the complete annotated works of uh, William Shakespeare. That helps some, but you really would like for it to narrow it down some more. And so this is actually a, a tough choice as a designer of a system. How specific do you get in, in your search results? And then you have to tokenize these documents. A lot of times they're in strange formats. Um, you've got to massage the, the, the letters into words that are recognizable by the search engine. We'll go into all of this. We're going to form posting lists, put them in the database or the index. Uh, we're going to talk about querying, snippet generation and scoring. I put up there, and I don't think I have any slides on, but they're there. Okay, so here's an example. Here's part of a website. This is, part, this is just a, a, bit of, a little bit of text from the SQLite website, actually. Uh, talking about a book that's available on SQLite. And this is what the search engine would see. It's a bunch of words, but it's also got markup in there. And, you know, you don't really want to necessarily search for the markup. So kind of the first thing you need to do is identify the parts that you really want to search for. So when you're, when you're building your index, you've got to, and, and this, you know, with HTML, it's not too hard uh, because, you know, you can just el eliminate the tags more or less. But it gets a little bit more complicated because you've got um, elements, you know, the, the ampersand and then the name, and you really need to resolve those. And then this is English, and English is, is really nice in that um, uh, it uses white space. White space is a wonderful invention. You know, white space is a relatively new invention. Did you know? Do you, are you familiar with the history of white space? Um, I, I credit um, St. Patrick with white space. You know, the, I'm, no, really. No, it's, and St. Patrick didn't invent white space himself, but he founded uh, a bunch of monasteries in Ireland that were copying documents during uh, after the fall of Rome, and um, they eventually got run out of Ireland by the Vikings, but um, the other monasteries that they founded in, in the mainland of Europe, uh, they were copying on these documents. And at the time, uh, you know, sometimes they would put a little dot between words, or sometimes they'd just run the words together. And then, but in this tradition, somebody had the bright idea of saying, oh, we'll put a little gap between the words so you can tell where one word starts and the next word begins. And this was happening around uh, the 10th or 11th centuries when they first discovered this. This is a relatively modern invention white space still has not caught on in the Far East. Okay, so if, um, you know, Thailand and, and, and China and Japan and Korea, they just kind of run it all together. And this presents interesting problems to the search engine is to, you know, where does one word start in and the next word start? Question, comment. Characters and stuff, don't they kind of have natural white space between the characters? 
Well, I mean, no, with the, the characters, are there any native Chinese speakers in the room? You know a little bit of Chinese. Huh? <laughs> I, know, I, know, I know none. I know very little. But, but yeah, I mean, the, the, each, each character actually, actually represents a sound. It's a syllable. And, and a word can, can consist of two or three characters. But, of course, the same syllable has 10 or 100, depending on which character it, uh, syllable it is, 10 or 100 different characters that you use to spell that syllable, depending on context. But given the characters, you can always, you can always produce a sound for it. You know, given a particular dialect. Of course, you know, you move around in China and the different characters are pronounced differently, just to complicate things even further. Um, but I talked to Chinese speakers and they tell me that, um, you know, if, if, you mix, if you use the wrong symbol for a sound, uh, native speakers will understand what you mean. It's kind of like in English, if, you, if you're writing, if somebody's not a native speaker and they use um, T-H-E-I-R, when they mean T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E, you know. We, we native speakers, we laugh at that. Oh, yeah, stupid foreigner, right? Yeah. Well, but it's the same kind of thing. They understand what you mean if you use the wrong character, but it's still, you know, you know stupid Americans, you know. Anyway, uh, my point here is that uh, breaking things up into tokens is, is kind of easy in English and in Western languages. It gets more difficult in some other languages. And the algorithms used there are tricky, and you know they tend to vary a lot. And um, they're kind of well, we won't. I won't even go go into that. I don't have a clock, so uh, does anybody know what time it is? That can keep up. Okay. So first step is to kind of remove the markup from the document that you're going to be indexing, and and you're left with these terms here. Um, and then the next step is to, to kind of homogenize the text a little bit. Convert everything to lowercase because you don't, if you type in an all lowercase search term, you, 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 you want to find cases where, you know, it might be an init initial capital too. I mean, you don't want those to be excluded. And, um, it, and I, I altered this text slightly for this talk by putting an umlaut over the first A in Java just to spice it up a little bit because I didn't have any text easily at hand that had but you know if you're dealing with European texts and stuff they'll have a lot of these marks like that and um, you typically want to remove those because those are not helpful for searching. Comment here? No not really uh, I guess you could maybe think about that but I don't think any of the search engines do that. Um, so you kind of homogenize the, the words a little bit by removing extraneous marking and punctuation, diacritics, case folding. Um, and this can be, be, be kind of tricky too. I've got one system that I was working on for a customer and um, they wanted to do this sort of thing and, and so people would write in Cyrillic fonts or Greek and I could transliterate it into to Roman characters to, before I do the search, which actually works out really well um, because you know Russian or, 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 or Bulgarian, which uses Cyrillic font, they're Indo-European languages. There's a lot of cognates with with other e uh, European languages, and so you can still find words even though they're written in completely different characters. And that's that's a really cool thing to do. Um, there's a, a package that was originally done for Perl called um, D-Unicode. Instead of Unicode, it's D-Unicode. And what it will do is it will take any kind of Unicode text, uh, you know, Han, Chinese Han characters, Japanese, Greek, Korean, uh, uh, Hebrew, whatever, and will convert it into just, you know, plain old ASCII for you. Transliterate it so that it, it's, you know, it's the way it's supposed to pronounce. And that might be something that you'd want to do before you do this. The other thing you want to do is stimming. This is a very language dependent thing. And that's the basic idea between, behind stimming is to try and find the root of each word. So, for example, uh, definitive gets simplified to just definite or something. That this is an example of the output of a classic stimmer for English called the Porter stimmer. 
It's a classic, uh, the guy Porter, what was his first name? I forget all of a sudden. Uh, he wrote this in the 70s or 80s, and it's just sort of a classic algorithm. Works great for English. If you use, it doesn't work for other languages. And so th the problem with this is it's very language specific. You have to have a stimmer that applies to the particular language that you're working on. And if your document includes a mixture of multiple languages, that could be a really serious problem. But, and so this is, these are the sorts of things that you have to deal with. Here I've stimmed it using the Porter stimmer to sort of simplify some of the words and get them down to um, their canonical form. And then sometimes you want to remove stop words. Uh, these are little words that occur everywhere and that are not generally considered helpful for searching. I did some experiments for this talk and I think in a little bit of sli in a slide later we'll see some of the major search engines do stop words and one of them does not. And we'll talk more about that in, a, in just a minute. So once you get all of these, um, get it processed like this, you take every word in the document and, and suppose this, we're giving this document an identifier, in this case number 2351. We take every word in the document and then you have these things called posting lists. And, and these are like records in a database. And uh, we've got a posting list for the word uh, new. And that posting list contains every document that uses the word new. And we've got, another, we've got a posting list for every word that can possibly be used. And so there's a bunch of these. And, and depending on how many documents you have, these posting lists can get very large. So that's building the index. This is, this is what, um, uh, that's what you do in order to construct your, your, your full text index. Now to query it, uh, you take your query, here's somebody's typed in, recommend a new book is their query, and you have to do the same processing steps on the query that you did on the original document. Uh, we're going to do case folding and diacritic removal, and then you have to do stemming, we changed recommendation to recommend there is the only change. And then you pull out the stop words. And it's very important here that you use exactly the same algorithm for transforming the query text as you used when you generated your index. Which is, this is a problem with full text search. That means that if you want to tweak your, your, your stimmer or in, you decide that you don't want to do case work, you have to rebuild your whole index. You've got to start over. Um, so once you get all that, uh, you've got these three words. You look up the posting lists for the three words in your search. And then you take their intersection and that's going to be the documents that have all three words in them. And there's a really efficient way to do this because the, the idea is that you, in the posting list you store these document IDs in, nu, in, a, in numerical order. Let's say it's ascending order. So, you know, the early documents come first. And so you've got these lists that are in sorted order and you can process, process them as streams. So you've got all the... Um, so if this were a full internet search, there are literally billions of web pages that contain the word book and billions that contain the word new. And so both of those posting lists are very large. And so you can, you're streaming them off the disk into this little algorithm here. You're getting two, two identifiers, two integers at once. And if the first one is less than the second, you want to toss it away. If the second one is less than the first, you want to toss it away. If they're the same though, you can pass that down because that's the intersection. This very quick merge, it happens very fast. And you can gang this up. You can do multiple operations this way to do as many terms as you want. Processes, processing it through these little intersect operators like that. And that'll very quickly get you just the documents that have all the words that you're asking for in them. Well, what about or? Same idea, except for instead of doing an intersection of the posting lists, you do a union of the posting lists. So here the document changes slightly. Um, uh, the algorithm changes slightly. You, if, if, if 
you output the smaller of the two, and then if they're equal, you consume them both. Otherwise, you just consume the smallest and you repeat until you're done. So obviously with an or, you're going to get more out of it than with an, an and, but you still get the result. And you can combine these uh, just like you can with an inter intersect uh, operator. And, and you can even do things like uh, recommend a new book about Tickle or SQLite, where you do some unions and then some intersections. And then at the bottom, you just get a list of all the documents that have this stuff. And you know, if you're careful, if, if you have some a priori idea of which documents you're going to want to return most frequently, like you know, you know, you know the, the ones that, that want, you want to be near the top of your results, give them very small document numbers, put them in first, and so they're gonna come out of the list first in this operation. So um, if you wanna do a prefix search, uh, that's just really kind of doing a union of every, all of the posting lists that start with TH. So, you know, here's a bunch of posting lists. Uh, I just used the words that were on the, the, I just went and checked all the posting lists on the SQLite website search index. And, and so, and you've got a bunch of these and you can feed them all into a union operator all at once and then find all the words that start with TH. Now, if it's something small like, you know, all the words that start with T, you can actually end up with thousands and thousands of these all feeding into one thing. And you could, if you wanted to, think about creating a separate posting list just that contains all words that start with T. Question. So the comment was some, some engines require you to have a minimum of three characters before they'll even attempt this. And that's just probably to limit the load because, you know, if searching for T star is going to find a lot of documents, generally. I, it, it really, um, it depends on your collection. I mean, uh, T star works fine on the SQLite website because they only have about a thousand documents there. Uh, but, you know, it, if you get into a larger document set, uh, you might want to put that restriction in place. That's definitely the thing. And remember, users don't normally do these, these prefix searches like this. This is sort of a facility that, that is wrapped by the larger application to allow you to do search as you type. So if you're doing a search as you type type thing, you might want to wait until you've got at least three characters before you start doing the search. Okay, so that's all well and good. Uh, an interesting thing here is to note this structure. Um, I don't, have, you, have you heard of the Google file system? Yeah, you heard of that and Hadoop and all of these, big file. And I read about the Google file system and there's a, I, this was back when Google used to publish papers and contribute you know, to the general knowledge. Now they're kind of secretive. Um, they, there was this thing on the Google file system talking about how they needed a, a network file system and they had all these different requirements and how you know, the files were really big and you would, you would read a lot and you would append to them but you would never really update them very much. And I thought, what an odd set of requirements. But then you start looking at it in terms of this reading posting lists and taking intersections and unions of them and then you look at how the Google file system is structured and you think, mm-hmm, yes. <laughs> That's not a coincidence, I, I suspect. I have no inside knowledge of how Google does their, their full text search, but one, one can make suppositions. All right, so what about phrase queries? Uh, this is a very useful facility, and, but it can be tricky. Uh, the naive approach would be to do just an ordinary AND query and then gather up all the documents that contain all three words or all however many words you're, you're, you're searching for and then pull in the complete text of those documents and scan the complete text to see if those words occurred in the order specified and beside each other. And you know, for a lot of cases that, that's a reasonable thing to do. Uh, but you know, there are some cases that like you know, a, a phrase search for the and but as an example. You might ask, well, why do you want to do that? Well, this is a pathological case. Those three words occur in just about every document out there, but they very, very rarely occur in that order. Okay? And so I actually tried this phrase search on uh, the, the three big search engines, 
And it did not work on Bing or, or Yahoo. And I think that it's because those two search engines are using stop words. They don't allow these words in the search at all because they were just giving me random results. But it actually worked on Google. And I found some documents that contain the and but in that order. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> I th but how do they do that? And then they get the, they, you know, they're, they're, they're searching for literally, uh, what, what's, what's, how many documents do they have now in, in, in these search engines? Does anybody know? I know that it's more than will fit. You can't count them with a four. That was a big deal back 10 years ago when Google had to go away from using a four byte integer for numbering their documents. Okay, that was, that was a big deal for them. I haven't heard anything since. I mean, how many bytes of integer do they need now? Does anybody know? Pardon me? One mole. Oh, yeah, whatever, one mole. <laughs> no, it's probably not that many, but still, they have the, oh, uh, more than four billion documents, and they did this in a few milliseconds. How did it do that? Well, what you have to do for the phrase search thing is you have to store some additional information. You go up and you take your original document and you number all of the words in the document. You, re you remember the position of each word. And then when you store the documents in the posting lists, you also store its position within the document. And if a word occurs in a document more than once, it has to be in the posting list more than once. So for example, book occurs up here three times at position 5, 15, and 25. And I have to store that three times in the posting list. And so then when you do your query, you have a slightly more complicated intersect algorithm that has to consider uh, not only the document number, but the position within the document. And, you know, they have to be off by one. Well, in the simple case of a two-word phrase, off by one. If it were a three-word phrase, then the first one has to be offset by two from the, the last one. and You get the idea. Um, and you can do this and, and very quickly find out all the documents that have the phrase. And, hey, this really kind of goes shows you how to do the near search too, doesn't it? Because now if you want to find all the documents that have two words near each other, you just have to tweak this little thing here to be a range query or you know, a range expression where x is greater than this or less than that other and then that'll work just as well for that well. So you kind of get phrase, phrase search and range query are kind of the same thing. Comment? Question? Eliminate it that way? Yeah, you are. So the comment was, you know, maybe if you look for words in the phrase that were unusual and only gave you a few documents, you could kind of use that as a basis and then examine those few documents. And yeah, you can pull some optimization games like that. But, um, you know, if you're, if you're looking for the phrase, the but and, this is the only way to do it. And in my experiments, apparently Google's the only one doing this, okay? So... Uh, and, and of course, you can combine these sorts of things and, and have big trees uh, nesting up. Uh, one thing that is very important, it's important to balance this tree. Oh, oh note, note in particular that this really lends itself to parallelism. Man, you can really parallelize this in a big way because each one of these little comparison operators could be on a separate machine. And each one of these posting lists could be pulled off of a different disk drive. You can re really paralyze this, but it's important that you kind of balance the tree. You don't want all. You don't want the. Tr if you've got a lot of search terms, you don't want the tree going off in one direction. It's important to keep it balanced so that you can get performance out of it. Okay. So, so that's how you find words and you, you know that you've actually searched for. But people don't really enter the words that they want to search for. Uh, <laughs> they enter words like this. Um, the doctor says Aunt Betty has pneumonia. What is that? <laughs> um, uh, John's going up to Philadelphia to visit somebody. And what's a yacht club? <laughs> 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 I 
No, and, and uh, um, yeah, and, and, and yeah, uh, my friend's daughter's going to school. She's studying sociology. Psychology. Or psychology, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, and we don't want to, we don't, we, we, we're, we're all against bureaucracy around here. You're in Charlotte, North Carolina now. I don't know, this is the, the correct way, you know, the place where they keep books, you know, where you go to borrow books. In Charlotte, North Carolina, it's pronounced library. Okay? That is the way it is pronounced. If you say library, oh, stupid Yankee. <laughs> okay, that's the way it's pronounced. But, you know, and I tried these. And, um, uh, and, and in the search engines, they, they actually do the right thing on all of these. So their spelling correction really has to be a part of this because, you know, your users are not going to do the right thing. So how do you do the spell correction? Here, um, uh, why is this slide here? Oh, yeah, here I've, I've typed into Bing and I've misspelled SQLite database. And it says, yeah, yeah. It's, oh, but no, I put the plus sign on front. If you don't want the, web, the, the search engines to do the, the, the spelling correction for you, um, I found that you can put a plus sign in the front of the query and it'll, it'll take literally what you type and won't try and spell correct for you. At least Bing and Yahoo work that way. Google insists upon spelling correcting regardless of what you do. If there's some magic way to get Google to not spell correct, I have not figured out what it is. So yes, do a plus in front to disable spelling correction. Google has the reverse though. If you type that stuff in, it'll, it'll say, show in search results for correct spelling. Did you actually mean, you idiot, did you really <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I, you know, I, how, do you, how do you get it to do that with um, I'm feeling lucky? I haven't figured that out yet. Yeah, I think putting quotes around each misspelled word is kind of tedious, but it works. Yeah. But do, okay, so uh, so the, the comment was you can put quotes around each misspelled word and that prevents it from spell correcting. Okay, I did not know that. And the, com the comment was that they got rid of the plus sign thing when they came up with Google Plus because there was an issue there. That's entirely possible. So, uh, so spelling correction is a big part of search. And spelling correction is a big problem. It's been researched for a long time. And there's just tons of papers out of there on this. The big problem with spelling correction is first, identify words that are misspelled. Because English has the total vocabulary of English is like a million words. Nobody in this room knows more than 30,000 of those. And, you know, any misspelling you type has a strong chance of being another word, you know? <laughs> so, so figuring out which words are misspelled is a hard problem. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it there. Then you have to locate possible corrected spellings. And then you have to rank them by quality. So uh, the, we'll start at the end. Ranking by quality, is, it's, uh, there's a bazillion ways to rank spelling corrections by quality, but everything keeps coming back to this idea of edit distance, where you, you um, count the number of insertions or deletions and substitutions, maybe transpositions, and the total amount is the edit distance between the two words. Um, and sometimes you might want to weight that. So let's see. Here's, here's the edit distance between pneumonia and pneumonia. Uh, we can insert the P change the W to a U, delete the A, change the Y to an I, so the minimum edit distance is four. Comment? I believe the first thing um, that Google in particular does with, uh, with words that aren't in a dictionary um, it, is it'll actually try a uh, sound text. Okay, so the, uh, there was a comment about sound text. Don't get ahead of me. It's coming <laughs> I'm going to get there. Just, just chill. So, um, yeah. So, and, and the other thing is you might want to wait this uh, because, uh, you know, PN is a common little thing that people mess up. So, you know, putting a P at the beginning of the word, you might want to give less weight to that. Um, changing a vowel to another vowel is a pretty common thing. So you give, so that's not as bad of an edit as, as some other things. And uh, so I just tossed it, you know, and of course the weights here are pretty much subjective. Uh, how do you come up with good weights for, for, for measuring this? Um, I, I chose one at random and it gave me a, a weighted at a distance of 1.71, which is still a lot closer than four. Um, so one strategy would be that, you know, you start with the misspelled word 
And, and this is, and if you look at, if you do an internet search, oh, how do, you, how do I do spelling correction? There's a real popular, you know, there's a real popular website where you can do this algorithm in Python in 22 lines or something like that. And uh, you start with the misspelled word, and you start, you know, making all these edit operations, and then and checking to see if it's a word in the in the dictionary, and you know, and then check, and then do the edit distance, get the result, and keep the best ones, and those are your your possible spelling corrections, and this works okay for typos, stuff that you know where the where you really only have one thing wrong. Uh, but where you have things like pneumonia to pneumonia. Uh, that technique just doesn't work because up here there's only a few hundred you know when, when you're trying to take this and find all possible changes there's only a few hundred possible changes you have to make before you find the right word but down here if you start randomly making changes to pneumonia trying to change it into pneumonia you'll have to look at literally billions of different changes before you actually stumble upon the right one you know, and if you have a warehouse stacked to the roof with servers, maybe you can get away with that. But if you're trying to do this on your, your iPhone, not so much, okay? You, you gotta come up with a different algorithm. So, phonetic spelling correction. Um, the other approach is to kind of guess what the word sounds like, and then find vocabulary words that sound similar and compute the added distance there. So, uh, this is the kind of the soundex approach here, where you take the, the letters and you map them into numbers. And these are letters that, that produce sounds that sound, that are similar, like vowels and semi-vowels, or they just get eliminated. Um, um, bilabials get one. Uh, rear stops get two. Uh, labiodental stops get three. Uh, semi-vowels get whatever. Comment. Yeah. Google and, and you know, anybody who's producing uh, any kind of spell correction or search capability, yeah. they have to have a huge corpus of misspelled words that they've seen people search for. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't it just be easier to keep an index of misspelled yeah. words? All right, so the question is, would it be easier to keep an index of misspelled words? There's all kinds of games that you can play. Um, uh, and it depends on, if you're Google or Yahoo or whatever, and you, you're able to mine your traffic to come up with a library of misspelled words, that works great. Uh, if you're trying to build a, a, an app for Android and the whole thing has to fit in a certain memory budget, then having a big table of misspelled words doesn't work as well. And even then, there are going to be misspelled words that are not in your table. Sure, sure. So you've still got to be able to do this. So probably the best strategy is to do the first thing I talked about, you know, where you, you uh, do the spelling correction by trying variations on the misspelled word and then doing a phonetic thing. I like, I was going to say, I like to go to, to letters rather than numbers. That makes more sense to me. And, um, and then, then also have a lookup table. It, it, I'll, sh I'll go back to my original uh, example. Um, for example, yacht. I'd spelled it Y-A-T. There's no way that you're going to, to really make that happen you're going to have to have a lookup table. That's sort of an exception to the rule. There are a lot of words that are that like, like that way. So you've got to have the lookup table to help you. But these are all, you've got to really use all three algorithms. So I like to use um, a phonetic code that you know maps letters into letters. That makes more sense to me. So pneumonia and pneumonia both map to the same thing here. And Philadelphia and Philadelphia both map to the same thing here. But Yacht Club does not. Yacht Club would not match here, so Yacht Club would have to be in my, my dictionary of commonly misspelled words. The reduction, does that work in other languages that use that same 26 character alphabet? It does, amazing. We, Eastern languages it does. Uh, or like if you're, if you're searching Chinese though, you, you, you translate to Pinyin, and then, then you can do it that way and hope that the person writing it doesn't speak Cantonese. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, so, you, well, but, but you know, the, the, the pinyin is just the Mandarin dialect, and so there's a bazillion other dialects, so you got that a problem. But that's, yeah. So you can translate, transliterate anything into just the Roman characters and then do this translation here, and it works pretty well. It actually works pretty well. It's amazing what you'll find. And uh, like, um, uh, I, I stumbled across Yacht Club because somebody had typed something like that in, 
in, in Cyrillic. It was some Cyrillic word I'd never heard of before. And, um, and it translates to um, yacht port, actually, was what it was. And, you know, it, when you transliterate it, it comes out yacht port. And it found it. <laughs> I was so amazed. But it's a, it was a Russian word. I'd never heard it. So anyway, this sort of thing works well for phonetics. Um, not so good for typos. You really need to combine both algorithms. And you need a table of exceptions. Back up above, I had my list of, of um, troublesome spellings. I tried all six of these on the, on the search engines. They, they corrected them all correctly. Uh, but uh, and all of these would be corrected by the phonetic changes, except for Yacht Club. You've got to have a table of exceptions for that one. That was just, there's, no, there's no way to figure that out otherwise. Okay, so the comment is if you extend this method to include lots of phonetic rules of, but if, if you can extend it to include lots of phonetic rules and you might be able to get Yacht Club to work with this phonetic matching. To do that, you're going to be, you get, you get to get a lot of rules. Have you ever looked at the rule set for double metaphone, which is one of these phonetic hashing, hashing things? It's horrendous and you just don't want to memorize all that. You don't want to learn it and plus it only works for English. Whereas a simple rule works for a lot of languages uh, and then you can just use a, a small table of exceptions to handle the, the hard cases. You, you must have applied also the same, same, same method for pneumonia because three letters are making two letters. Well, yeah. No, because the vowels are taken out. The vowels are taken out, yeah. Yeah. So. All right, I, a, 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 the question mark means it's time for questions only. Oh, please repeat the question. Okay, I'm sorry. So let's just move on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw already passed my memory horizon. So I actually put together, so that's sort of the tour of why spell, uh, um, uh, of what's, what's involved behind um, Full text search, and my plan was I've, I wrote up a little bit of code for full text search that you can just download and, and use on your website to do it. And I was going to actually demonstrate for you live putting this on a Linux server at, at, at Hurricane Electric in Fremont, and I was going to do that over the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, that didn't work out. So I scrambled around and I put. I copied the website and put a little web server here on my Mac in the process of discovering that Linux boxes are way, way easier to set up for this sort of thing than Macs are. <laughs> and uh, so this is, and, and, and I, I, uh, I fudged my, um, can, you, can, you, can you read this? Yeah. I can make it maybe a little bit bigger. Um, I fudged my Etsy hosts file so that it thinks that the SQLite website is 127.001. So whenever I type www.sqlite.org, I'm not really going out over the internet. That's going to kill you in about three days. No, I've, yeah, I've, I've, I, yeah the, the comment was that's going to kill me in about three days. I, I desperately need to remember to take this entry out after this, <laughs> after this talk. Um, Yes, yes. So, all right, here we go. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to make a uh, temporary directory. And I'm going to CD there. And then I'm going to get the source code to this little project. It's C code, and you can download it. It's open source and, and do what you want with it. And um, I'm going to use Fossil to get the code. Now, it's on a website. Fossil is the configuration management system that I wrote. But it's on this website here. And you can see the URL there www.sklite.org site search is all you need to go to. And if you go to timeline and you click on this top link, there are two, I tell you what, well there's going to be two links here under other links to download it. I just didn't have that turned on yet, but that will 
when I get back to the office and have internet, I'll, I'll make sure that those links are there and you can just download the code that way. Um, but I'm going to do fossil clone, and you can do the same thing if you just install fossil. Fossil is a standalone program. It's you know, single binary. You just put it on your path somewhere, and then you can do all of this. That's the only dependency that I'm tell that's, that's in this little demo is that one, one command. So if you just get that one standalone binary for Linux and put it in your path, you're good to go. And then I'm going to do HTTP colon www.sqlite.org site search. Oop. <laughs> site search. I'll just do site.fossil. Okay. And that pulls all the code. And now we've got the complete website here. And then do, and so right now in this directory, I just have that one file. And then to do fossil open site.fossil. And I'm showing you this just for your benefit so that you can do this later yourself. So you're taking notes, right? So now I've got the files for this thing. And then I type make. And it's got a copy of SQLite. I'm using the SQLite has a full text search engine built in. And I'm using that for this particular search engine. I promised you I'm not pushing any particular implementation of, of, of search engine. There's a lot of them out there. If you want to re-implement this one, I, I don't care. I did it because it, I can include all of the source code I need in this one little thing. And it's all self-contained. So I, I, I have this binary now called site search. Good to go. Now I'm going to go over to my website. Pretend that I am, I'm, I'm logged into my server. I'm going to go to... This is the website here, and it's got a bunch of static HTML in it. And then I'm going to go to a directory called CGI. Now, if this were a website run from Apache, then in this directory, there's, oh, but if I do uh, that, there's an, H, uh, uh, an HT access file, if this were Apache, that says that everything in this particular directory is to be run as CGI. This is not really Apache, but I just put the file there because I figure you probably are running Apache. Does it really? Yeah. I've got Apache on here. I spent all that time putting this on here and it, I, I didn't have to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so there was a comment that there's Apache actually on the Mac. Okay, so after the talk, you're going to show me how that works, okay? I, I went and I put a different web server on here. But anyway, um, so now I'm going to create, and because remember, I'm, I'm secure shelled into remote server and I don't have graphical editors, so I'm going to use ED. Who knows how to work the ED editor? Old timer, yeah. Anybody in here without gray hair, you don't have gray hair, Did anybody in here without gray hair like mine that knows how to use ED? Wow, very impressive. I wrote my first compiler with ED. I have punched cards. <laughs> okay, so ED, and I'm going to call it, what do you want to call it? Um, FTS search, maybe. Okay, and so I'm going to append to this. I'm going to give it a shebang. Users, DRH, temp, site search. That's the name of the program that I just compiled and you put it wherever your web browser can find it. And then I'm going to do database. It's got to have a database to work off of. And I'm going to put my database at users drh xyz.db. Say again? Did I miss something up? Oh, that's because I hadn't written it. Now, that, now it won't say that anymore. It'll be there. Look. There. Say it's there. <laughs> we are talking 1970s technology here, okay? Don't, don't, don't get upset with ED, okay? It, okay, so now it's there, and I've got to uh, give it execute permission. Okay, and we're not quite done, because I've still got to create the database, and to do that, I've got to run my little utility, site search, FTS search, init. That created the database. Now I have to populate it with content and I'm going to do all the HTML files that are directly above me and then I have a bunch of other HTML files in subdirectories 
and it's reading every one of those HTML files and doing all of those steps that I talked about during this lecture and pushing them into the database and it's done. Okay, and so now we're good to go. So I can bring up my web browser and uh, I put this under CGI and what did we call it? I forgot what we called it. FTS-search. Okay, and what do you want to search for? <laughs> what, 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 what was, I didn't hear it. Pneumonia. Pneumonia. I, it's not, it's not, that's not going to work. I have five minutes. Uh, well, SQLI, well, it's going to find a lot of hits on, oh, what did I hit? I didn't hit the right thing, clearly. CGI, FTS search, Ohio, Node document sound. Compile. I put, I gotta put Q equal, compile, there we go. And so, well, but you know, that didn't really work out because there's this backlink cross-reference document that I have there, which is not something that you really want to appear in your search results. That's a bad, because you know, that's, that's, that's this really weird document that just tells me about all the hyperlinks that I have, because the website is automatically generated. So I want to get rid of that document. Let me. Um, Go over here, I'm going to say, uh, let's drop, what was the name of that document? It was um, doc backlink cross ref or something. Something cross ref.html. So I dropped a couple documents there. And I'm going to repeat this search. And those first couple of documents that are cross refs. Uh, should go away. And they do. So, so um, anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cheap little search engine there and it doesn't do a whole lot. It does not do pneumonia to pneumonia. I, don't, I have not attempted to do spelling correction in this, this particular demo. It's some simple C code and you're welcome to it. Download the code and play with it and use it on your site or whatever if you want to do. And uh, we're about out of time, so I'm going to open the floor to questions. You've already asked all the questions. All right, yeah, query engine. Yes, go. Uh, question, uh, why would we use the, Lucene the question is, why wouldn't we use Lucene? Well, I mean, maybe you did. I mean, uh, if you want to use Lucene, that's fine. I, I would say I'm not pushing a specific implementation. There's Sphinx, there's Lucene, there's search engine. Is, does, is there a search, search engine, a uh, full text search built into Postgres? Who knows? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There is. There's full text search built into MySQL, which I understand is very bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> it does have SoundX. It does have SoundX. Okay. Yeah, it does um, one level matching beyond like you match things that match that query. So if you look up something like query, it'll do a second generation search and find everything that's like MySQL, Postgres. Right. So, so there's a lot. Yeah, uh, Lucene's very nice. Um, uh, I actually, we studied Lucene very closely. We went into the code, and the SQLite implementation is modeled after Lucene, circa, nine, circa 2006. Lucene may have been rewritten since then. Um, and, but, and if you want to do it in Lucene, have at it. I just I want to do something really simple that was, with Lucene, I'd have to get, have Java on hand, and I'd have to get a bunch of stuff together and set up a big environment. And if you want to do that, it's fine. I wanted to put together something that was really simple and compact and standalone like this. I have 30 seconds. Question. So, does anything change when you start ranking documents, uh, say for Google or my particular problem is, is like with MediaWiki, you do a search and you have 3,000 wiki docs for your system and none of them really. Yeah, the question is ranking. Ranking is a whole nother topic. That's a whole nother lecture. So it it's a big problem. No, there's a, there's a lot of strategies for ranking. Um, uh, you know, putting putting the important documents first, but also post processing. So on this system, we get you know uh, say a hundred different ones, and we go through and look at the frequency of words of the of the search words within each document, which we can pull out of the posting lists by being clever. And there's some formulas that have been worked out for you know finding words that occur a lot in the one document you're looking for, but don't occur anywhere else, and that that document is important. 
But then if you get onto an internet search where people are trying to game your search engine, you have to be much more clever than that to avoid uh, people uh, stacking the deck and trying to get their stuff up to the top. Okay, we're out of time. Thank you very much. Good job. Thanks. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the, uh, you know, of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these, you know, these, these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer bootcamp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.
When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.